Hi all. I am Eetu Pikkarainen from Oulu in, in northern Finland. And I will describe some uh, core starting points of action theoretical semiotics of education. <coughs> in addition to John Dealey, this lecture is a tribute to Andrew Stables because I am quite assured that it was definitely him who should have been giving this lecture. But unfortunately, he suffered from an aggressive cancer and passed away at the beginning of this year. And in addition, I must mention that also another important forerunner of semiotics of education, namely Inna Semetsky, has passed away. I heard it just uh, two days ago. Andrew, or Andy, as he was usually called, was a philosopher of education who owned a great part of his life to develop and promote what he called a fully semiotic uh, approach to education and learning. A remarkable signpost was his book, Living and Learning, a Semiotic Engagement. And he was a very cooperative person, and he founded the Informational International Network of Semiotics and Education. The main features of Andy's fully semiotic approach are the following. Learning as deferred means that we can know and decide <coughs> only afterwards whether we have learned something and in what particular experience. Uh, the anti-Cartesianism means for avoiding unnecessary dualisms, especially between mind and matter, but also others. Then there are aff affirmation of a reality of Ex uh, experience, uh, liberalism and pluralism, and general unpredictability of the uh, future, etc. Briefly, life as meaning making and learning as an inseparable organic part of life. John Dealey <coughs> visited Finland many times and I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times in conferences of the International Semiotics Institute in Imatra and also once in a seminar in Oulu. There are at least three uh, special things I have learned from him. One is to, uh, to appreciate the work of scholastic philosophers. Second is the possibility of physiosemiosis. And the third and the most important was the biosemiotic idea that at the bottom the meaning of any perception or any sign can be only either positive, negative or neutral. Especially the two latter things have had a remaining impact to my thinking, as you can perhaps see what follows. Uh, so, what is action theoretical semiotics? Uh, let's approach the question with some basic definitions. First, as usual, semiotics means the study of uh, the properties, functions, structures and systems of science. Uh, secondly, a sign is any kind of an object, animate or inanimate, uh, substance or property, and so on, which has a meaning. So, meaning makes a sign. And finally, meaning is the relationship of that sign object 
to the action of some subject. Uh, these definitions somewhat depart from the uh, respective definitions of many other schools of semiotics, but I hope they are at least understandable. Especially the concept of sign is quite broad here. Uh, thus, a sign is a sign because and only because it has some meaning for a subject of some action. And meaning is the relationship between that sign and that action. Uh, the meaning is the very central concept, but it is not uh, independent. It depends on the relationship between these two or three uh, other participants, the object and its properties, and the subject and its action, which for its part depends on the competencies of the subject. So, in a way, everything depends on competencies, and we will return later to that important concept. The meaning can depend either more on the object or more on the subject. The latter case can be called subjective meaning and the previous objective meaning. Consequently, there are or can be two different meanings for one and the same sign object. They can, of course, be also quite overlapping. The subjective meaning is determined uh, on the one hand by the way the subject experiences and feels the sign. This is near to the idea of firstness in Persian semiotics. And on the other hand, how it reacts to it in its action. This is in principle corresponding thirdness by Perse. Uh, the objective meaning depends on how the sign object causally affects the action of the subject. Does it, for example, hinder or help the action? These are the dealies negative and positive alternatives. And this is, of course, very near to the uh, secondness of the Persian category system. In addition, especially for humans and other social animals, the meaning can depend also on other subjects and their meanings. This phenomenon typically requires communication and sharing of meanings between different subjects, and thus brings us to the area of symbols in Persian semiotics. These intersubjectivity meanings form the, also the vast research area of Saucerian tradition of semiotics. Uh, very often it seems that subjective meaning is a, a perhaps learned consequence of the objective meaning, but it can also be a consequence of the intersubjective meaning. Uh, from these dependencies, we, we can reach to the uh, three levels of semiotics, or rather, um, uh, three overlapping semiotic spheres. Mm. More important than these uh, spheres, as such, are their borderlines, and especially the transition over the thresholds. Uh, these three broad spheres are ordered so that, in, in another way around than in the slide, physiosemiotics forms a basis uh, above or on which uh, the biosemiotics can evolve and has been evolved, and respectively Biosemiotics forms a basis for anthroposemiotic sphere to develop. Physiosemiotics is a much disputed concept in semiotics generally, 
And that is why it is perhaps safest to call it a pre- or proto-semiotic sphere. It cannot be strictly semiotic by the definitions stated above, because any non-living entity cannot be a subject of action in a strong sense. Uh, but still, if this sphere is to make properly semiotic spheres possible, then there must uh, not be too strong difference between them, or uh, otherwise the semiotics proper would uh, never be possible. Our time does not allow us to study deeply the features of physiosemiotics and transitions to bio biosemiotics, the birth of life. Naturally, it is neither so central for semiotics of education than the next transition from biosemiotics to anthroposemiotic sphere. This latter transition is exactly what is traditionally thought to happen in education. Uh, but before we go to education, we must go back to basics again. Uh, why action is an important uh, question and concept. Action is often understood as a process where the subject causes uh, changes in the object or objects. This is partially a reasonable view, even though one-sided. By action, the subject may transform its environment, and consequently, it may also cause changes to environments of other subjects. That is why not only our own action is important for us, uh, but also the action of our neighbors. We need not only consider and direct our own doing, but also the doings of other people. The current action of people can be directed by management, guidance, policing, etc. But the future action is guided mainly by education. For semiotics, action is an important concept because if we understand action more holistically, uh, we will see that action is not a consequence of meaning, but quite the reverse. This is a very central point and we will return to it many times. But what is action? The more holistic way of understanding action sees it as a general way of being, of living beings. Vita activa in a broad sense. A bottom, at bottom, action is self-preservation and it is what makes living beings alive. Action in this sense, can then be divided at least to next two levels, homeostasis and control of perception. Homeostasis uh, is a general process in all living beings, and perhaps all also outside them. And it means all the circular mechanisms which keep the necessary life-critical properties of the organism in their suitable limits so that uh, the life can go on. This is realized possibly uh, by uh, very complicated biochemical processes which require adequately safe and stable uh, conditions. These mechanisms are mainly uh, genetically determined and inherited. 
but uh, because the conditions of life are not usually so safe and stable, is, uh, especially animals, but in principle all species, have developed for themselves an other uh, level of action in addition and above the homeostasis, and it can be called control of perceptions or perceptual control. This level is, uh, by animals, realized mainly by the sense organs, neurons and muscles. Uh, this form of agency, uh, this form of action is largely, especially by humans, formed by learning during the lifetime of individual organisms, or at least it makes learning possible. Perceptual control typically affects uh, non-life critical properties outside the organism, but at the same time, it can prevent the dangerous disturbances to the homeostasis. And this is its uh, evolutionary meaning. Perhaps the uh, biochemical based biosemiotics and phytosemiotics focus on homeostatic processes while perceptual control forms more the sphere of zoo and anthroposemiotics um, traditionally. Uh, but these uh, both forms or levels of action are based on uh, negative feedback loops. So uh, what is feedback? It is a certain kind of uh, a circular causal process. Say that we have some entities A, B, C, etc. If A affects B and B affects back A, we usually call this uh, interaction. But if A affects B, and because of that A's effect, B affects C. We can call this mediation. B mediates the A's effect to C. And if then, because of B's effect to C, uh, C F, uh, affects A, so that it mediates B's effect, which is originally A's effect, back to A, then we call this whole going on as a feedback process. Uh, mediation here does not mean that the effects in different places of the circle were similar. Every mediator, A, B, C, etc., uh, probably changes the effect, increase or decrease it, or even convert it to its opposite. This ensues that feedback processes can be divided to two main types, negative and positive. Homeostasis and perceptual control are based on negative feedback which uh, negates the external disturbances and keeps the acting systems in balance. Instead, positive feedback tends to accelerate the changes caused by disturbances, and if this acceleration is not somehow limited, it can eventually destroy the system. Uh, of course, as suitably limited, however, positive feedback episodes can be also beneficial to the systems. So, if we are interested 
in action of living beings, and especially of humans or animals, it is most fruitful to study it as a control of perceptions, uh, utilizing the theory, a perceptual control theory, or PCT, developed by William T. Powers. Uh, control generally means keeping some variable or property near some goal value, or if it, it's not yet near it, then drawing towards it. For perceptual control, we need these four integrated phases. First, we must create an internal perception, which is a neuronal signal, uh, of a current value of some perceived property. We call this external property uh, a corresponding envir environmental variable, or shortly CEV or SEV. Secondly, we must have a goal value for that perception. Uh, thirdly, we must compare the values of these two signals, goal and perception. Do they match or is there a difference called error? Fourth and finally, we must produce an environmental output according to the error value uh, to affect uh, the SEV so that perception would change and or remain so that uh, it's near the goal and then uh, we must recycle back to the first phase. Uh, note that action means this whole continuous process. The plain output is only part of the uh, action and it can be called doing or uh, behavior. And secondly, note that these four phases are circular, continuous, and in a way uh, simultaneous, as shown in the next slide. Uh, this is a, a schematic diagram of a basic control loop and an elementary control unit or ECU as abbreviation. Uh, the thick horizontal line in the di diagram differentiates the environment which is below and the organism and its three-part uh, elementary control unit which is above the line. Here we see how the SEV affects the input function, which creates the perception signal. The com comparator compares it with a goal and produces the error signal, if there is a mismatch, which affects the output function which then causes changes in the en environment to the SEV and it causes also some side effects in the environment and also in the organism itself. That's an important point for later. Disturbances are the various external effects which can disrupt the perceptions goal matching. Uh, note that an echo can perceive and control only one perception. It cannot, for example, know anything about what causes the disturbances. Uh, the simultaneous mm, means that there are all the time some signals going on. 
but uh, there is also a, a so-called uh, lag between the service effect and the output back to it naturally. Uh, after comprehending that diagram, one inevitable question may arise. From where does the goal come from? What determines the goal for just this perception? One adequate answer could be that the way how all these functions inside the organism uh, mediate the effects are or can be learned. They can also be partly inherited. So also the goal could be somehow either inherited or learned in the life history of that organism. But there is also another answer based on the idea of hierarchic control. A uh, theory of hierarchic perceptual control is based on these theses uh, because one echo can control only one perception and because life and action requires control of myriads of perceptions by a countable number of echoes, these echoes must be hierarchically organized uh, for the coordination of uh, separate uh, control processes. This means that there is the lowest level where echoes are connected straight to sense organs and, and muscles. This is the level depicted in, in the previous slide and this is also the level of reflexes. Above this level there is a multitude of levels so that every level sends its perceptions to the still upper levels and sets the goals for the lower levels by its inputs. So the abstract and complicated human perceptions uh, like styles, principles, identities, etc. are combined level by level from the simpler lower level perceptions. A little, but very little, uh, similarly like syllables are combined from letters and words from syllables and uh, sentences from words and so on. In, in this slide, this diagram tries to describe visually a possible structure of a control hierarchy of some mid-level perception. Every echo gets the input from the perceptions of the lower level and as its output uh, sends the goals to lower level echoes. The feedback loop goes through many echoes and finally through the cells in the environment. However, the connection via cells in the external environment is not always necessary because, as we know, we have also internal action. Our thoughts do not necessarily or directly affect our environment. This internal action is an essential part of especially human action and it must be accounted by the theory of perceptual control and it goes something like this. 
Uh, every echo creates memories of its perceptions. These memories affect its future output. Uh, output can be sent instead or instead of or in addition to lower echoes as goal, also straight to input functions in the same level, which causes either uh, remembering of past perceptions or uh, imagining of possible perceptions as new combinations of the parts of old uh, perceptions. Handling of these uh, non-real, in a way, perceptions without connection to external environment is called controlling in imagination. Uh, this can have consequences to current and future action, but also, like any action, to the homeostatic systems uh, causing state changes in the organism which, may, uh, which we may feel as emotions. And then, consciousness is a central function of internal action and it seems to choose the most important focus areas of internal or external action. Uh, make new connections between uh, perceptions and also direct the action. The systematic study of consciousness is just in a starting phase in PCT. And now we get to the concept men mentioned in the beginning, the competence. All action is based on competences, which are special properties of the subject of action. They are the something which make it possible for that subject to act, uh, act in the way it acts. <coughs> Uh, this concept is based mainly on the semiotic theory of Kremers. Uh, competence is a peculiar and in a way abstract uh, dispositional property so that it manifests only in action or rather it can be inferred from manifest action. It is not perceivable as such like many uh, more useful properties. But it can still exist even uh, if it is not perceived and when the subject does not act. Also, unlike usual properties, competencies cannot be affected by action directly. Uh, they can be uh, affected indirectly and we will return to, to this later. The subjects carry their competencies with them and these competencies determine their action partially independently of the changing environments. An extremely important part of Kremersian semiotic theory is that of modalities or modalizations. It made it possible and necessary to divide the concept of competence in different areas. First, there is the uh, usual competence as an ability to do certain things. Kremers goal called this uh, semantic competence, or perhaps it would be better to call it a semantic component of competences. Uh, it means that we can have a competence of speaking, walking, singing, playing 
piano, cycling, etc. However, these semantic competencies do not necessarily have much or any effect uh, to our action in any particular environment. How and whether these competencies ever manifest as action depends on what Kramer's called modal competencies and which he divided and named according to modal subverbs, namely French modal subverbs originally, as want, can, know or know how <coughs> uh, and must. Uh, especially the competence of wanting seems to be necessary for manifesting any action and it connects nearly to the concept of goal of perceptual control. On the other hand, the competence of must and must not on, uh, uh, connects to our morality. In P PCT, the perceptual control theory, we can do a little different division of competence areas, like in this diagram. The, the semiotic competence in the left determines how and what perceptions we can produce or construct. The value competence determines how and what goals we can have or set for our perceptions. And finally, behavioral competence determines how we can behave in our environments, what we can do, and thus affect the uh, selves of our perceptions uh, so that we can control these perceptions to fit their goals. The detailed relationship between these uh, three PCT areas and, and the four Kramersian model competencies are still under research. From competencies, we will get to learning, which can uh, now be defined as a process of change in the competencies so that these changes are caused as side effects of subjects' own action. Now these side effects affect the subject itself. <clears throat> it cannot be too much stressed that learning is not action as itself, but a side effect of action. In action, uh, uh, according to the competencies we already have, we try to control our perceptions of something perceivable and as a side effect of this control our competencies may change. Remember that competencies as such are not perceivable and thus not controllable I neither. Uh, learning process contains many kinds of mechanisms, among others memorizing and habituation affect competencies. More interesting and quite complicated process is what is in PCT called reorganization, which means uh, quasi-random uh, trial and error type alterations in the control structures caused mainly by errors in homeostatic and active control systems. Uh, also, it seems that one and perhaps the main function of consciousness 
is that it can di- direct and guide the reorganization processes uh, by making them less random and more rapid. If some part of our controlling is not successful, the consciousness soon focuses on that area and causes accelerated reorganization just there. This phenomenon is utilized, for example, in therapy, and in teaching, consciousness can also be used many ways. Teaching is action, and its aim is to cause and direct learning, usually of other subjects, and thus develop certain kinds of competences. Uh, But because action cannot affect competences directly, it must happen indirectly by affecting the learner's action. Teacher tries to control student's competence or a student tries to control her own competence if teacher and student are in the same person. Uh, But because competencies are unperceivable, this control must happen partially in imagination. The competencies must be inferred from manifest action. However, teaching is cyclical social action, which Kremers has described aptly as a narrative schema, where the teacher first makes or tries to make the student to do something, gives a task. This is called manipulation by Kramer's schema. Then the student does or tries to do that something as performance by Kramer's. And finally, the teacher evaluates the student's doing in the phase called sanction. According to the results, of this evaluation. This all must be started again or proceeded to another topic. In educational research, this kind of episode is sometimes called a pedagogical cycle and it is clearly a negative feedback loop. Note that any educational process be it a a degree program, school year, or a lesson, can be seen as a pedagogical cycle. Thus, every cycle may consist of smaller cycles, and often teaching seems to be the more effective, the smaller the cycles it consists of. Every cycle may contain also many kinds of sub-phases and alternatives, but we will pass these details over in this presentation and go to still one important concept. Namely, Bildung. All that a person can learn is not necessarily beneficial for the future of that person or her community. Neither is even all what is thought. We like to call education only such processes which at least hopefully create useful and beneficial competencies to the educated. In continental philosophy of education, this kind of beneficial, adaptive, innovative and creative development is called Bildung. 
Bildung is a problematic concept because its content cannot be strictly defined uh, because of our vision of future as open-ended. However, it is a necessary placeholder concept which is needed when we try to define education as I think we must do also in semiotics of education. And I suggest this kind of definition. Education is a social action system which attempts to promote building by teaching. But what is then building? Especially from the point of view of the practice or praxis of education, it is necessary to consider the aims of education. What should be taught or what kind of competences should be developed? In the end of my lecture here, I take up some most central issues. Uh, because of the open and unpredictable future, the traditional emphasis on balancing many sides of culture and competencies is still more important. The semiotic and especially value competencies which are even more difficultly perceivable than competencies generally, need more attention than the seemingly easier behavioral competence. Uh, the generic modal competencies, how the students will want, can, know and must do what they do, is more important than plain uh, semantic competencies. And uh, these generic competencies include also all the general and metacognitive competencies. And it is still more critical to learn to be careful with the dangerous positive feedback processes like uh, the climate change and the accelerating conflicts. Uh, finally, I think that what we mean when we talk about uh, moral responsibility of human beings is best understood as an ability to be aware of the side effects of our individual and collective actions. Here are the main references of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Comments and questions are very welcome, also criticism, and you can send them to my email. <laughs>